ESPN 1420, ESPN1420.com. The NFL Draft Thursday. Currently, we're going to talk to Chris Landry. He's joining us, a football lifer. He served as a coach, a scout, an administrator at the college football and NFL levels. Worked at LSU as a coach, uh, as a coach and a scout with Bill Belichick in Cleveland, as a coach and a scout with the Oilers, with the Titans, and he owns uh, his. He uh, operates his own coaching and scouting consulting business. So he serves uh, NFL organizations and college football programs in terms of uh, advanced scouting, coaching assessment, development searches, things like that. And now he's a guest on our show, despite being as busy as he is. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing good. Good to be with you. First round of the NFL draft begins uh, tomorrow night. As a scout. Who, who do, who's the most can't-miss prospect, in your opinion, in this year's NFL draft? I, I think that it's, uh, although there's no such thing because life happens and injuries happen, uh, we all know. I think Leonard Williams of USC is the cleanest player. He's the most scheme-diverse player. He can play in the 3-4, three, 4-3. Four, four, three. He's played the two-gap scheme, a one-gap scheme. Um, he's durable. He's 20 years old. He's smart. He's tough. He's a great worker, great character guy, football character, personal character. And you, know, you can't go wrong with a defensive lineman that can play up and down the line and play different spots. He's not going to be a great edge rusher. He's, you know, he's 300 pounds, and he can, he can get skinny and rush the pass or play with heavy hands, dip his hips. So he's, to me, he doesn't have a whole lot of weaknesses, um, and I think he's the best and cleanest player in this draft. What's the farthest you think he could potentially fall in this draft just based on – you know, team needs and, and perhaps certain positions they'll be drafting for? Um, I, I would say four. I would say that, you know, the, the quarterbacks go one and two, and Jacksonville just decides that we they want to go with that Leo in, that edge rusher, and that could be Fowler. I, I don't think the Raiders are going to pass him up. Now, in theory, um, if – if the Raiders say, you know, look, we're just going to hone in on the receiver and, and do that. And, you know, I, I think the Redskins prefer an edge rusher. They may go Beasley. So, in theory, you're looking at maybe six or seven. In a worst-case scenario, I, I think the Jets have got some problems right now with Muhammad Wilkerson. Might they do that and maybe trade him? But I think that's possible. I could not, absolutely no way, shape, or form I could see him lasting past Chicago at seven. But I would say four uh, more likely and then uh, seven as a, as a last resort. Here's the other thing is that's a guy that no one's talking about as we talk about trading up for quarterbacks. If he slips a little bit, um, you could see some teams making a move to get him. Um, so that's the range I see, uh, and I think a lot of people see him as maybe the best player in the draft. So I don't, I don't foresee him dropping that far. Chris Landry, uh, pro and college scout, our guest. That was my next question, Chris. You know, if he does potentially, if that scenario plays out and he falls to five, even six, you know, there are a couple of mock drafts out there that, that have the Saints moving up to potentially get this guy since they have a bevy of draft picks. Uh, you know, I mean, you say he's the number one overall pick in the dr overall uh, prospect in this year's draft, and a lot of sites and a lot of scouts tend to agree with you on that one. If the Saints moved up to take him, I, I think that, you know, while some fans might be upset they moved up again, that would be a, a can't miss. As you said, there's no really such thing as can't miss, but as close as you can get to can't miss as, as can't miss can be in this in this Leonard Williams kid. Well, it certainly would be a great, great acquisition for him. Now, it would be very costly. I mean, because if you're a team, <clears throat> let's say, like Washington or uh, or the Raiders, who I think would be open for business, uh, maybe the Jets. I mean, you're not going to want to move down that far. Now, I think a team that might be interested in moving up is a team like Atlanta. So if you're sitting there and you're, you're Oakland, you can move from four to eight, still get your receiver, um, and that that is still within Rangers. becomes a little bit of a drop-off when you get to 13. And let's remind everybody out there that we've had a tough week, uh, particularly in the last 24 hours with – Shane Ray getting Dean with off, Dean with off the field. Randy Gregory. Those are two guys that we'd be talking about drafted in the top six or seven picks of this draft. They're no longer going to be in the mix. So that pushes up everyone else. So it makes it more and more difficult. So if you're sitting there at 13 and you're the Saints, you've got a list of guys that you think are going to be available. They're now 
removed by two because now it affects everybody else in front of them in terms of who the players are going to be available. So it, it may be difficult. It would be really, really cost prohibitive for the Saints to move up because I don't think a team is going to want to move down that far. Well, what's your th- how far do you think Gregory and Ray fall in this in this draft? Um, you know, listen, it, all it takes is one team, but I, I would think that there is if you if you build a consensus, which is not necessarily again the way to go. I, I think that you could see them both drop as far as the third round. Um, wow. I think that it is very possible that somebody late first round, second round says, "Look, you know." We feel that the the risk is worth it here relative to who else is on the board. Uh, but, um, I, you know, in, in, a, in a general rule, I think third round, but but I think you have to start. You, I think they're, they're on the clock late first round to say uh, middle of the third round. Uh, they both have cost themselves a ton of money. A scout, a coach, an administrator, Chris Landry is our guest. Hey, go check out LandryFootball.com. There's all kind of goodies there. Chris, Give us a little insight into your website and, and what it offers to the fan that kind of wants to get get beyond a lot of the stuff that, you know, frankly, you can go read a number of places on the Internet. What what separates you guys from, from the majority of the pack? Well, what we tried to do is try to, to provide the website from the viewpoint of a coach, a scout, a football administrator. So what we, we do is we take you inside the film room. We're in the war room where decisions are made. So this time of year – we break down exactly what's going on in the draft room. We're going through all the scenarios. We've had, we got all the draft boards up, the horizontal board where you compare all the positions, all players, regardless of position. Then the vertical board where you've got all the positions, all the running backs, uh, all the receivers, and you've got them ranked, not just listing a top 10 or a top 50, but determining where the cutoff point is, how many superstar uh, ability players, how many immediate starters, how many potential starters. How many guys with the, with the, with the have a chance to make and contribute great? So we break all that down and give scouting reports on them, uh, just like we give in the draft room, just as I do for teams in a, on a consulting basis. So you get um, all of that. You get an in-depth breakdown of team needs, team strategy, uh, their personnel moves, their updated depth charts, all the things that we bring inside the draft room uh, you can access now as a fan to see this is – just literally how it's done and you know a lot of focus is on well mock drafts and with this really what I try to do is focus on the process that gets to the fan to the point where they can understand why certain decisions are made uh, and and how you get to those decisions and um, I think if you're a fan and you like the game of football uh, we try to cover that now all year round we cover football so it's not just the draft we we break down the X's and O's and the personnel and the college game and the pro game so we think it's a unique look inside the game of football and kind of takes you inside to where, you know, if you haven't been there, you don't know what it's like. We bring you in that coaches meeting room, that scouting meeting room, the draft room, uh, the uh, the decision-making process, so how to offer contracts and how do you go about making trades, things of that nature. At Landry Football is the uh, Twitter handle, LandryFootball.com is the website. Chris Landry, longtime NFL scout, our guest right now here on the Great Scott Show, the Great Sports Callers Open Think Tank. Chris, I want to ask you about Marcus Mariota and kind of take us inside the scouts, the coaches' mind. What kind of a player do you think he'll be at the next level? And and the follow-up to that is, where do you think he goes in this draft? He's a high-character, high-intangible quarterback, which is really important to me. He's got what I call transferable skills to play the quarterback position. Um uh, you know, he's got good arm, very good athletic ability. Um, you know, to me, um, what you look for in a quarterback is the leadership, the uh, the capacity, and the willingness to learn. And every quarterback comes from certain types of systems. And the system that he comes from, he has to make decisions at the line of scrimmage, call a lot of plays. But it's going to be different. It's going to be different to the pro game. I think we're seeing – more of a transformation of certain coaches and certain teams. Um, you know, we see it in Seattle, for example, um, Washington in the early stages of RG3, where you incorporate some of what a quarterback can do as you try to utilize those skill sets while developing more of a complete pro-style game, and which is making plays from within the pocket and so on and so forth. 
So to me, I don't focus on what they did in college, but, but how they did it and what are the transferable skills. It's, it's the biggest misconception as well. He doesn't do that. He's not going to be able to do it here. Well, no, that's not true. It, it really depends upon the guy's, uh, again, uh, capacity to learn and his willingness to learn. And I think his is really good. Now, how successful he's going to be will depend upon the circumstances around him. Um, who coaches him, which system they're in. And, and for example, if you go through uh, two coordinators in five years and you go through two or three offensive systems, well, none of these quarterbacks are going to be very good. Give me the one that's going to have stability of coaching, uh, stability of building a good team around them, and they're the ones that are going to have the most success. We don't focus enough on how we raise and develop quarterbacks in the league. We focus on, hey, the draft is done, it's over, that's all done. No, no, it's just the beginning. So I think the variables for him to be successful are around him and not him. I think he's going to be really good. Uh, I think there's a good chance he goes two to Tennessee or to someone that trades up with Tennessee in the second spot. Chris Landry, our guest. Chris, as someone who, who spent a lot of time scouting players like yourself and that has been on NFL staffs, what's the craziest tactic you've seen uh, perhaps a front office use to try to elevate or, or perhaps deflate a player's stock to help benefit them in the draft? Is that overplayed in the media, or, or does that stuff go on a little bit? Well, it does go on a little bit. I mean, there's no doubt that we live in a different world where uh, peop- stuff are put out there. I always warn people out there, you know, media friends and, and, and fans that call in uh, to shows like this and whatnot is remember this, that the people that are making the decisions are not talking. It's the people that are not making the decisions that are doing the talking. And if they're talking – they're telling you something that they want you to report for a reason. Uh, for example, um, the year I drafted Eddie George, anybody that would ask didn't, didn't, didn't uh, really uh, tell anybody because I don't really feel comfortable in lying, but anybody that asked, I overplayed how much I thought of Tim Bianca Batuka. Um, the Saints, for example, were very high on Bianca Batuka. That's the year the Saints took Alex Molden right. in the corner of, of Oregon. Um, so I think anybody that kind of followed us thought, yeah, they like Tim Bianca Batuka more. And we kind of led people to believe that we loved Ricky Dudley, the tight end of Ohio State. Uh-huh. A lot of people thought, well, you know, they, they, they would probably like Eddie George. Uh, we kind of uh, made people, yeah, they got some really good players. George Galloway's a good player. You know, it, 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 Ricky Dudley's a good player. So much so that we felt like that, that enhanced our chances of getting a trade done with Al Davis of the Raiders. We moved down. Al moved up to get Ricky Dudley. We still got the guy we wanted all along, which was Eddie George. And with the fourth-round pick we got from the Raiders, we used it to take John Runyon, who was a really good tackle, a Pro Bowl tackle in our Super Bowl run. So we, we, you know, we, we felt like you know, we, if you can kind of get people unaware of what you're going to want to do, and, and people today will kind of assume certain things, We'll let them go down that path and, and, and think that way because it will have an effect on, on uh, okay, maybe well, where, where you can get a guy. Uh, the the follow-up to that, uh, Chris Landry, our guest, ESPN 1420.com. I mean, I would imagine all the teams probably uh, probably play the same game, Chris. So yes. w- no, with that knowledge, knowing, well, they've probably kind of leaked this information a little bit. I mean, how – how effective can it actually be if everybody's sort of not trusting each other or not sure if they believe exactly what they're hearing? Well, here's what I my, – my school of, uh, of uh, rule of thumb and my school of thought on it always is if it makes sense from a football standpoint and the way we always did it inside our draft rooms, I had our scouts, um, in, in particular our pro personnel guys, we looked and we looked at the depth chart. We understand what type of scheme or system – that a team plays. We understand where their strengths and weaknesses are on their roster. We understand their coaching philosophy of what they like. So if you hear something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, it's usually smoke. If it does make sense, I mean, just logistically, it, it usually is, is true to form. Uh, a lot of it is speculative. Um, and, again, I think you just have to trust your instincts. Uh, look, the, we, we were on the phone the year that we drafted Steve McNair. Uh, Tom Coughlin picks up the phone. And calls, I think people felt like we were going to take Steve McNair. Tom Coughlin called and said, um, you know, we're on the phone with Minnesota. They want to move up. 
uh, you know, and, and, you know, obviously with the idea that, oh, they want to come up and they're going to take your quarterback. You know, Jacksonville's two, we were third. That year was our first year with the uh, with the organization, and it was the expansion year where Carolina and Jacksonville were picking one and two. So we inherited a team in Houston that was bad, and we couldn't even get the number one pick. We had the third pick. So Tom is, is you know, basically baiting us, and the reality is, in the end, you know, sitting there with Ford Reese, our general manager, I said, look, they're not going to go all the way down to Minnesota. They're calling us because they know they were going to take Tony Baselli, and they were going to lose Baselli going from two down to eight or nine, wherever Minnesota was. Going from two to three, uh, they still get their guy. So they were trying to milk us out of a pick, and we just, you know, we just held firm and said no, and then about 10 seconds after we hung up the phone with them, their card went in with Tony Baselli, and we got our guy in, in, in McNair. So, it, 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 you know, I, I think you have to – here's what I always say is you have to be prepared just like a game plan for a game as a coach. You have to have it all down. You have to think it through because when the heat of the moment gets there, you don't want to react uh, emotionally and overpay or overmove. Think it through. And sometimes you can't think real clearly – when you're on the 15 minutes and everything's going, you know, haywire. So I think if you if you have a good game plan and you stick to it and you let your board speak to you, you spend two years and millions of dollars setting up this board on determining who you think are the best players. To heck with what other people think. You know in your heart what you think are the best players for you, and 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 you set your board. Let your board talk to you. Too many times when people make mistakes is when they panic and reach and and react to outside forces. Just ignore the noise, and you'll be fine. Great insight from Chris Landry. He a uh, longtime NFL scout and coach, currently operates his own coaching and scouting consulting business, and get in-depth stuff on all of the players, all the prospects, LandryFootball.com. Go check it out. Chris, which players do you feel are, are currently being overvalued a little bit, just in, in terms of some of the mock drafts? Well, I think what you're going to see happening, and it's as we speak, and I'm doing something right now, ironically, that you mentioned it, on, that's going to put up on the website, is, is we're going to see a reaction to Ray and Gregory. Those are guys that are going to, would have been top six picks. So what does that really mean? It means that we're going to see some maybe overreaction to some players, like, for example, some good players, but players that are going to be overvalued, um, like Eli Harold of Virginia. Nate Orchard of Utah, uh, Trey Flowers of Arkansas, all good players, but they're going to be the benefactors of, of uh, Shane Ray and, and Randy Gregory's transgressions. They're going to move up. Keep in mind, Scott, you've got, I've got 19 first-round graded players. That's a high number, only because I have to incorporate a lot of different teams and a lot of different schemes. Right now, this year, uh, you've got teams with only 12, 13 first-round graded players. So beyond that, you're talking about second-round graded players by pure numbers that have to go in the first round. I don't think people realize that. They think 32 picks, they're all first-round graded players. Well, no, they're not. I mean, if you've got 19, for example, then picks 20 through 32 are going to be second-round graded players. So, And if you've got players rated like I do from 20 to 41 that are the same grade, 6-4 grades, well, then you can go in a number of different directions with those picks. So I think you're going to see – that position be affected. I think you're going to see the receivers be affected. Brashard Perriman, son of, of um, Fred, Perriman. Fred Perriman, who came out of uh, Miami years ago with the Lions. Brashard's at Central Florida. He had a great workout. He's inconsistent as a hand catcher, but I can tell you, a lot of coaches that have worked him out have fallen in love with him. Don't be shocked if he goes really high, and don't be shocked if you see some other receivers as a result of maybe Cooper and Kevin White going a little bit high, and then Devontae Parker of Louisville, you're going to see guys like Jalen Strong and Nelson Aguiar uh, going, and Devin Smith of Ohio State going a little higher because you've also got Dorio Green Beckham, a first-round graded talent that's got off-the-field character concerns. So I think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see some corners that are going to uh, maybe be adjusted a little bit in a positive. Kevin Johnson of Wake Forest. Byron Jones of Connecticut, who's a phenom workout guy, but not as good on film. Um, he he's going to move up because you've got Marcus Peters, uh, a corner from Washington, that has got some off the field issues. 
Jalen Collins of LSU. Um, you know, it just came out publicly. Those of us in scouting were well aware that he's one of those guys in a growing number of LSU players that have tested positive several times for, for drug use. That may affect their status, which would only enhance a guy like Kevin Johnson and Byron Jones, who, again, are more second-round value, but will go first round. And then a guy, a guy like Todd Gurley, who's maybe a top-10 player in this draft, but you can get running backs a little bit later. Um, maybe he goes a little bit higher because, again, teams that might be looking at a Gregory or a Ray at the top of the draft now may look and say um, there's a complete drop-off after that. Let's, let's take one of those guys. So those are guys that I think – could be adjusted. I think some safeties. It's a thin year for safety. So guys like Demarius Randall of Arizona State and Eric Rowe of Utah are third round value guys because of their ability on film and in workouts. But because if you need a safety and you need a cover guy, they're going to be, you know, ascend in terms of value in draft slot. A guy like Landon Collins is a great box strong safety who can be an outstanding will backer and nickel. But if you want a deep cover safety, he's not for you. So that's an example of a guy that might slip a little bit. If you're looking for a box strong safety, man, you got to consider him in the top ten. But it's also what you're kind of looking for in making sure that, okay, I like this player, but does he fit for our style, our scheme? And then certainly you don't want to reach for need. You want to try to fix needs with value players, and sometimes getting that just juxtaposed is difficult in this process. ESPN 1420, ESPN1420.com. We are visiting with Chris Landry, longtime NFL scout and coach, currently uh, oh, uh, operates his own coaching and scouting consulting business, serving both NFL organizations and college football programs in the area of pro and college personnel. Trey Wayne's top cornerback in a lot of mock drafts. Is he the top cornerback on most of these draft boards, in your opinion, Chris? Or is, is he being slightly uh, overvalued a little bit? Now, I think he's a really good player. I mean, he's a faster Darquees Denard who came out of there. Um, Mark D'Antonio does one of the better jobs of coaching that position. He is uh, their technique sound. He is a press cover corner with some size, really good speed instincts. He can flip his hips. He can, you know, squeeze a wide receiver playing off. He's um, he's an excellent tackler. Uh, you know, I think oftentimes people will look and say, well, top ten guy, is he um, special in terms of, you know, just great elite speed? He ran 4.35. He doesn't play quite to that speed. But he's pretty doggone good. I, I think he's great value. I've got a, a first round grade on him, and I think I think he's the the cleanest and the best corner in this draft. I think you can you can look at guys like Jalen Collins, which is a, they're a little bit longer. Marcus Peters of Washington uh, is outstanding. He's had some coachability issues. If you you, you really talk to the coach at wa- coaches at Washington, um, they have some issues. Talk to Steve Sarkeesian, uh, who recruited him at Washington. He speaks highly of him, so I think people are going to be uh, a little bit across the board on him. I, I think Trey's not only the cleanest guy, I think he's solid. Is he a guy that's going to come up? Uh, is he a Patrick Peterson guy? No, he, he's not, but he's really good. You can plug and play him for years to come, and I think he can be really good, particularly in a press concept. So he's, he's starter ready uh, week yes. one, you think? Yes. What, what, what players do you feel uh, are currently maybe being undervalued in mock drafts? Um, a couple of, not so much a sleeper, we'll get to that, you know, maybe some guys in later rounds, but, you know, maybe a player in the first or, or second round that probably falls a little bit, but you feel like is, is maybe going to be better than, than, than where he gets drafted. Well, I think that there's um... – a, a couple of guys that I don't know if they'll fall out of the first – they won't fall out of the first round, but I think Malcolm Brown of Texas is a really good player. I mentioned Landon Collins. If you know how to use him and play him, I think he's going to be outstanding. Um, I completely understand the concern about the speed for Danny Shelton of Washington, but to me he's a power rush guy with a great motor, and I think he's got a chance to be really good at the next level. I like Eddie Goldman of Florida State. I think Eric Flowers of Miami is going to be a really good left tackle in this league at some point. Uh, I like Kevin Johnson of Wake Forest. I like the receiver from Arizona State, Jalen Strong. Um, I think those guys 
to me, represent really good players. I, I think after uh, Gurley and um, um, uh, you know at, at running back, and I think Melvin Gordon at running back, I, I think guys like Tevin Coleman and Amir Abdullah and Duke Johnson are going to be really good values at some point. Um, and listen, I love Denzel Perryman uh, of uh, Miami at linebacker. I don't like him in coverage, but I think this guy is – is a ball hawk, and uh, I think he'll be a really good player at the next level on rundowns. Yeah, I, I had him. Uh, I actually had him on my list of notes to ask you about because I feel like there's a possibility he could be there at uh, at 44 overall when the Saints pick in the second round. And I, I think you know an inside linebacker, a young one, they could certainly use. And you sound like you're pretty high on this guy. Do you think he he falls that far in the draft? Uh, I think that's about the range that he'll go. Maybe a little bit sooner at the top of that draft. Uh, I mean, the top of that round. Um, you know, again, I, he's the only concern I really have is I don't know what you do with him in coverage. They took him out in coverage at Miami, so uh, that that's a little bit problematic in this league. But but again, part of what the draft is about is knowing what a guy can do, and and working with that. Every player has weaknesses, so I think you can work around it. I mean, Teddy Bruschi was the guy that. I mean, what are you going to do? I was asked the whole time, what are you going to do with a 258-pound nose tackle from Arizona? And the, the reality is you can't play nose tackle. But this guy's smart. He's instinctive. He's tough. You know, he can do different things. And I, I think Perriman is not like Brewski because he can't cover like Brewski could. Uh, but I think that you've got to be able to live with the fact that you've got to take him out in nickel. And, and, and for people that understand, and I'm one of them, that you've got to build from third downs on, uh, th- this guy has some value, and I think you can do some things in coverage zone-wise where he can be pretty effective and you can hide him a little bit. Not a lot, but a little. Great stuff from Chris Landry. A few more for you, Chris. We appreciate the time. Hey, check out LandryFootball.com. We're going to get Chris to tell us all about it uh, again in just a moment and the great benefits you get there. But longtime coach uh, and administrator now of uh, uh, a coaching and scouting consulting business serving NFL teams, college football programs, and the like. Um, I want to ask you about a couple of, of Raging Cajuns there over here that uh, we are the flagship station of of the Raging Cajuns, Chris. And it seems like uh, Christian Ringo, the consensus is he's probably the most uh, likely Cajun to, to be drafted in uh, maybe round five or six. Is there, I mean, are you anticipating that, that Ringo gets taken in this draft? And after that, the follow-up is, Maybe any other Cajuns that you think could could go on uh, on Saturday. Well, I I think that you know it's not it's not a great group for them. I think that um, th- they've had better groups, but th- you know I think they've got some players that that are certainly going to be in camp. Certainly, I think have a chance to be late round guys. Um, and and I think Christian is an intriguing guy. I think he's a good football player. I think how he translates to the next level would be. Maybe the only concern, uh, but I, I do think he has a chance to be a, a, a late round pick. Um, he's a good young man. Uh, I like him a lot. Uh, I think he's, um, uh, you know, someone that I think you can, if you drafted him late and you brought him into camp, I think he could be uh, an effective enough player for you. Uh, certainly wouldn't embarrass you in camp. Would work really hard. So, uh, you know, I think the fact that you know he can do some things as a long snapper too, versatility helps you. So I think he's got a chance, but I think he's more of a of a priority free agent. I think Justin Hamilton is a guy that I would consider late. I think he's got some quickness. Uh, I'd bring Alonzo Alonzo Harris to camp. I think Broadway is a guy that that uh, deserves to be in a camp. Um, the big tackle uh, Daniel Quave is a good player, and um, you know I think that that Sean Thomas is a good player. He's just too he's undersized. So I mean Trim and Pat or are all guys that could find their way in the camp, but I don't, I don't know that we're going to see um, many, if any, drafted uh, out of this group. But uh, I think that, that certainly there's possibility late uh, of seeing the, a couple of those guys get their name. Chris Landry, our guest. W- which player do you think is going to be the better offensive lineman in the pros, Brandon, uh, Brandon Scherf of Iowa or Lyle Collins of LSU? Well, I think Scherf is a little more polished. He is a better technician as a pass blocker. Um, they're both good run blockers. I, I would trust Sheriff a little bit more at right tackle if I had to play him right there now. But I see both of them as really good guards. I've got I've got them both with six five grades. I think Lyle is more explosive as a run blocker, and he is more effective getting to the second level in the run game 
Um, I, so I think really in time with development, I think Lyle could be the more dominant um, guard prospect. Sheriff is right now, I think, a little bit more schooled in pass protection. I'm filling the blank for us, Chris. The best inside linebacker in this year's draft is blank. Well, I think that, to me, Bernard McKinney is a really good. He's a little bit like a Brian Cushing. He's tall, physical, he can take on. He's, uh, he doesn't do a great job of arting trash, but I think he's really good. I have a second-round grade on him. I, I think he's an outstanding inside backer prospect. Not a lot of inside guys. I think Stephon Anthony of Clemson has got a, a little bit different guy. He's a little bit more athletic. Um, he's a speed flash player, a more effective blitzer. Uh, doesn't take on as well. Uh, I think his instincts are good, not great. But those are th- those are the top two. I gave you two there. And, but to me, those are second-round value guys. ESPN 1420, ESPN1420.com. Chris Landry has been our guest this segment. Last question for you, Chris. Sleepers in this year's NFL draft, guys that aren't going to go in the first two rounds, but through your – you know, I guess studying and scouting and years of experience, you feel like they're going to be a solid NFL player and, and have a nice career. Uh, David Johnson, a running back of Northern Iowa, I think he's got a lot of the qualities I saw out of DeMarco Murray coming out of Oklahoma with the last injuries. I think he's going to be a really good player uh, at the next level. Uh, Jaquiski Tart, a strong safety uh, from Sanford, is a really good player. Uh, I think uh, Trey McBride of William & Mary as a receiver is a good-looking player. Desmond Lewis, a receiver from Central Arkansas. Uh, D.J. Smith, a corner uh, from Florida Atlantic. Um, I, I like Ladarius Walton, uh, the defensive end from Central Michigan. Um, Lyndon uh, Tall, uh, a outside uh, backer defensive end, guy that can play outside in the 3-4 and put his hands on the ground and nickel uh, out of Norfolk State. Um, I like Ali Marpet out of uh, Hobart College, an offensive guard that uh, I think is a really good player. He played left tackle for them, dominated at that level, and did a very good job at the senior bowl for us. Um, Davis Tull of UT Chattanooga, another outside backer. Those are some names that I think are going to be really, really good players at the next level. I, th- there's, to me, uh, there's some other guys that are not as much sleepers, but I think represent good value. For example, uh, Holali Kikaha, and I, I call him uh, affectionately eye chart. Um, out of Washington, he's an outside backer uh, that I think is a Rob Ninkovich type of player that would be a really good value for a team like the Saints. And uh, I've talked with them, you know, them about him, and particularly they, I think they like him, and um, particularly uh, Rob, who obviously was in New England with Ninkovich. So I, I think a guy like that is someone to keep an eye out for. Um, you know, Tyler Lockett to me is going to be a great slot receiver out of Kansas State. Chris Connolly, the receiver out of Georgia, because of the fact that they don't throw the football a great deal, particularly last year with their quarterback issues, I think his best football is ahead of him. Um, And, you know, I think Steven Nelson is going to be a good zone press corner from Oregon State that represents some good value in the the, uh, third round. So those are some of the names. There's a a few others, but I think there's still a chance, a a good chance to to fill a lot of needs so teams, you know, like the Saints can – can really improve their defense uh, with some extra picks uh, and uh, having extra picks like they do have at the five in the top 78. I think can serve them well if using those picks wisely. Chris Landry has been our guest. Great insight uh, information. And if you enjoyed it, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg for the hardcore fans out there and even the casual fans that are into their team into the draft. LandryFootball.com. Chris, you guys offer a whole lot that – Perhaps some folks can't get uh, other places, but they can get in the uh, the war room over there at LandryFootball.com. Fill us in a little bit about what you guys offer and, and the benefits of, uh, of listeners going and checking it out. Well, when we started this, when I was approached to doing this, I said, I, you know, they've got a lot of, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it differently. I want to do it for the fan that maybe wants to get a little bit more on the inside and understand more about the process and not just read about you know, uh, you know, point spreads during the course of the season or mock drafts in the off season, but really explain the process, kind of give the viewpoint from a coach, a scout, and administrator about the game of college football in the NFL. And right now we've, in the off season, 
the NFL drives a lot of the content with free agency and now obviously the draft. We're focusing a lot on that. So we've got draft boards. We've got scouting reports on all the players, over 500 players. Oral scouting reports like given in the draft room. You can look at the draft board, hear the reports. Not only just get, you know, get five or six minutes on each player where you really get a feel for what the player is or isn't. It's not about, well, this guy's good. It's about how a guy fits or doesn't fit a certain scheme. And so we do that for you. We've got draft boards. We've got detailed uh, draft strategies for each team's. Um, how we go about doing that, how things are done inside the draft room, how trades are made. So we in, involve a lot of that during the season. We involve a lot of breakdowns, breakdown of games, personnel. We'll get into the off season of breaking down uh, and previewing each team. So if you're a UL fan, you're an LSU fan, you're a, uh, an Oregon fan or a Miami fan or a Penn State fan, we've got it all covered. We break down the college game. Uh, we do that all year long, keep up with the draft all year long, and obviously break down the NFL game. So you're a Saints fan, a Cowboy fan, whatever, we'll break down personnel. We like to say if it involves uh, players, teams, coaches, or schemes, we got it covered for you inside the film room where the decisions are made uh, inside the war room. That, that's, that's what we try to bring to you, inside analysis and information that you're not going to just get from, from anywhere else. Football views from a coach, scout, and administrator, Chris Landry, has been our guest. Chris, appreciate the time. I know it's a really busy time of year for you, but uh, thanks for the knowledge, man, and uh, let's do it again in the future. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me, and um, it's great talking with you.